Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Jerry Dulac, my good friend, joins us. Welcome back. Great to have you with us on what's an eventful week. Well, Steve, always good to be with you, whether the week is eventful or uneventful. Always <laughs> glad to come on with you. Same, same here, Jerry. Uh, so I need to get your opinion on on Live and where everything stands with the PGA Tour. Well, uh, you know, I kind of have mixed feelings about it in this regard, Steve. Um, you know, first off, the whole thing is unfortunate. Uh, the way it is played out all of a sudden. I mean, what it was two months ago, what it was two weeks ago, and what it is now is drastically different. And it's become obviously a very contentious situation uh, with the PGA Tour and some of its members. Um, I, I think um, I think ultimately when this whole thing plays out, um, I think it's going to end up in court with these players who decide to go play on the uh, LIV tour um, when, when you know, how long that's going to sustain itself, how long those guys want to play there and take the money, even though I know they're not always just playing in Saudi Arabia, and when they want to come back to the PGA tour. For example, Phil Mickelson, who has lifetime membership after what he's accomplished. Why should he then be banned from the PGA Tour is a 1099 subcontractor. So I, I eventually see this thing ending up in court. I get the players who, you know, look, I mean, look at Charles Schwartzel, what he wins last week for a nothing 54 hole event. They pay him $4.75 million for a nothing event that, that matters, that counts for nothing. There's no world ranking points, there's no legacy to it. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't have any cachet beyond the money, um, but it's the money. And the counter to that are the people who want. And I get this. Who want to get up on the pulpit and talk about the uh, the righteousness of, of uh, you know, in the immorality of playing over there because of the Saudi government, because of their human rights atrocities, because of the way they treat women. I get all that too. Um, but there probably isn't. There certainly isn't a player on the PGA Tour who at one time or another hasn't gone over and played in Saudi Arabia for those large appearance fees and, and those big purses for those exhibitions. They've all done it. So now somebody's going to do it instead of once. They're going to do it eight times. Uh, Steve, what's the difference? You've done it once. You might as well do it eight times, correct? I mean, you either do it or you don't if you're going to stand on principle. And how many American businesses or businessmen have we seen over the years go over to Saudi Arabia and work there because of the no taxes and the large sums of money they make. And they go over and they work for a couple of years, you know, inflate their bank account, and then, you know, move back to the United States. I mean, we see it happen all the time in American business. So, again, I'm not defending any of those guys. It's just that, you know, how can you blame Lee Westwood or Ian Poulter on the downside of their career? If they're going to go over there and, and in three days in a 54-hole event win two, three, or four million, which is more than they're going to win on the PGA Tour, or chances are on the uh, on the European Tour for one event. And now, okay, so they play eight events. Let's say at minimum they win 250k. Well, that's another couple two million in their pocket at minimum, at minimum for playing a 54-hole event. So, yeah, the whole thing is unfortunate because. Mainly, it's overshadowed the U.S. Open. All the talk this week, Steve, yes. was the LIV Tour, the Golf Series, and and I, and I think and it's harming. I think the, I think guys like Phil Mickelson are taking a beating. Um, you know, Dustin Johnson has has kind of evaded some of that, but you know, Kevin Na, those guys. But you know, they're going to fire at all these guys: the Shambo, Patrick Reed. Every time one of them goes, and I know Rory has been outspoken. I get it. John Rahm had some strong comments. Uh, I, I get it. When you're a competitor, when you're an elite player, you want to play against the best, you want to be the best, and you want to win tournaments that matter, not those exhibitions. Except that how can you fault those? How can you fault Charles Schwartzel for playing for three days and winning $4.75 million? Well, what's interesting about this is that Rahm is from Spain, 
McElroy is from Northern Ireland. They both decided not to play the European tour, but come over and play here. Right, right. I mean, right. that that point is never brought up. I mean, I'm not trying to defend or any, but you do have to point out certain elements of this. Where what's the? You know, I realize the Saudi money part of it. That part I've got, but you are shunning the tour that you normally would be a part of and pushing forward to come over here and play. Right, right, and and, and you know, Steve, I was I was doing an interview today, and somebody said, you know, the Paul talking about this politics aside what about this what about that and i said well that's the problem that's what's causing the consternation is the politics the morality of it all or what they want to claim is the morality of it all and and that's right. what's dividing a lot of these people and, and and yet like i said there isn't one of those stars on the pga tour that hasn't gone over there and taken the large appearance fee and played in one of their events over the last eight ten years or however many years they've been doing some of those uh you know events out of season and and mm -hmm. they've all done it because of the money, and so, um, you know, it's it's really caused a problem for the PGA Tour. The PGA Tour has reacted like they did because I think they see it as a big threat. They see it as a big threat because of the money. But the reality is, again, too, Steve, you look at that event, Cheryl Schwartz will won. I mean, who really cares? Nobody cares about that event. The only person who cares about anything is the money is Charles Schwartz for the money he won, and that tour. They're hoping to get, you know, they would like to be able to get world ranking points because if these guys, let's say they play in these this tour for three, four more years, guess what? They start to lose world ranking points. They just start dropping and dropping and dropping. Next thing you know, they don't get into world golf championship events. Maybe they don't get into the majors if they're not otherwise qualified or invited. And so that's when it's going to, to blow up. And they're never going to get world ranking points when they play 54 whole events because they won't sanction those for the world for the uh, world rankings. you got to be 72 holes. So as long as they're playing 54 holes, that's not going to happen either. Right, exactly. Uh, and that's where it's going to – and the fans just want to see the best play against the best. That's I think that's, I think that's pretty much where the fan comes from. They don't want to see splits. You know, Stephen, that that idea that ideally is the goal of the LIV tour. Uh, you know, they talk about they want to try and get these players, pay them, but they want to pit the best players in the world against the best players in the world because, other than majors and three or four world golf championships, um, that's the only time you see it. But they figure by reducing the field to 48 players and having the top players in the world then those guys competing against each other is what they're trying to do, create these matchups. But, you know, Steve, that's no different than a made-for-TV event because the tournament right. itself that they're conducting, it means nothing. It means right. nothing. So these guys can go against each other. It's no different than Tiger playing Seal, uh, you know, in the Battle of the Bridges or whoever he went right. against, or Garcia right. or whatever. It's the yeah. same thing. It's a made-for-TV yeah. event, except these people don't have TV. And nobody right. really cares. The only thing the people care about with golfers in terms of competition is seeing who contends in the majors even more so even more so than the players in the world golf championships that's all that matters right. and none of these other events matter to these guys in terms of competition uh you know with the best players in the world what's interesting to me is the backdrop of all of this of all the places to have this happen the country club where francis we met and an right. amateur <laughs> crossed the street and beat Ted Ray and Harry Varden in 1913. This is an interesting course. Uh, this is another, you and I talked about Southern Hills and Gil Hance. Well, Gil Hance again. Uh, it used to have 3,200 square feet of greens. Now it's up to 44 in his redo, which is a little bit more than Pebble. But that's part of the feature of this place. What intrigues you about the country club? Well, you know, Steve, the first event that I did uh, that I covered out of town, beyond Oakmont and any major that was held there in Western PA, the first time I traveled on a tour to a major was in 1988 at the Country Club. And mm -hmm. that's when Curtis Strange beat Nick Faldo in a playoff. And, and you know, I, uh, I, while I remember little about the golf course, I'm curious seeing it on TV again. I do remember that it was just an old-style, old-fashioned old golf course obviously the oldest in america and and it was really neat and so when i saw what gil hans did at southern hills 
when I was at Southern Hills for the U.S. Open at Retief Goosen won and when Tiger won the PGA, um, yeah, it's Southern Hills, but it didn't blow me away. I didn't think, wow, this place is really special. But what I saw Gil Hans do with his refurbish was I was very impressed with the look to the point where I thought, wow, I don't remember any of that. Well, that's because it wasn't there. And right. I thought he did an outstanding job. And so I don't think he, he didn't change the character um, of the country club. And, you know, Oakmont is bringing him in for the 2025 Open. He's coming in next year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're going to, you know, they're, first of all, they're redoing all the bunkers. They're redoing the irrigation system. But they're going to change a few things. But they won't touch the contours of the green, and they won't touch the re-riding of the hole. That's like a no-no at Oakmont, and that's just not happening. So I don't know that what Johans is going to do will be visible to a lot of people. But he but he will come in, and he's not going to change the character of look at Oakmont. And, and I don't think he did a whole lot of that uh, at the country club. I think it'll be even be less so at Oakmont. But whatever it is, and he did L.A. North uh, for next year, which is where the U.S. Open is. And, uh, you know, he's become, he's become the designer of choice for these restorations of these uh, iconic golf courses. And, um, you know, what I've seen so far of the country club on TV, it looks fabulous. Obviously, Rory played well. He, he birdied his last hole, which is number nine, because he started in the back nine. He ended up at three under. So give me a, you know, a grouping of guys that we need to take a, a long, hard look at that you think can handle this kind of test on this particular course. Well, there's no question uh, Rory can do it. And the reason I stayed away from picking him, even though he won last week and he did it by birdieing the last two holes, uh, Rory obviously has, has he knows how to close because you don't win the events that he's had and the number of majors that he has without being able to close, even though he's never been able to close in on that green jacket. Uh, the problem with Rory is he always starts slow. He gets behind and then he has mm-hmm. to mount these weekend challenges and then next thing you know you see him move up in the leaderboard and then he has another top five finish, but he never really contends. So for him to get off to a fast start uh, I think is really, really important and really, really good for him and really, really bad news uh, for the rest of the field. Um, he's been playing very well. Um, if he can, you know, his, his, his short game has gotten a little better. His wedge game for a world-class player has been average at best, Steve. Right. And that's what yeah. really does him in. He does, you know, he's, he, mm-hmm. he doesn't turn, uh, you know, pars into birdies and he turns some pars into bogeys. Um, but he's been, he's been in pretty good form lately. Uh, Justin Thomas is a guy, you know, on a shot maker's golf course, which is what this is. You know, he shapes shots as well, if not better, than anybody on the tour. And so that was the guy that I picked to win, even though you don't see a lot of back-to-back major winners a, a whole lot. Um, but, you know, I, I look at uh, I look at Will Zalatoris. He was two over. He finishes minus yeah. one. You know, and the other mm-hmm. thing I liked about Rory, too, is, you know, he goes – he goes bogey free for the most part. I think he bogeyed uh, the seventeenth hole. But when you see guys in a U.S. Open not make bogeys, that's what I look for. For example, I look at Jordan Spieth. He shot the one over on the front. He made two pars. You know, bogey, birdie, bogey, birdie, birdie, bogey. Yeah. Uh, you know, the last two holes, bir- same thing. Birdie at seventeen to get the one. Bogey at eighteen. So it's nice right. that you make bogey uh, birdies. But when you start making bogeys, if not more, but let's just stick with bogeys in the U.S. Open, it gets tough. You're going to make them. But the guy who makes the fewest fewest is the guy who's going to contend. And when I see Rory, now I know it's only one round, but it is Rory. And when I see him do that to open, uh, that tells me he's very comfortable and very confident. And I just think um, I just think he's going to be tough to be, to be honest, even though it's just one round. But based on everything and based on who it is and the way he's been playing, and uh, he looks like a sure bet to me. And, and by the way, when you're going uh, bogey birdie, bogey birdie, in the U.S. Open, eventually bogey wins. That's right. That's, that's right. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, that's the problem. My friend, I don't care what the circumstance is, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, Steve, always good chat with you, my friend, and I'll catch up with you soon. Sounds good. we got to get out to the course here at some point. I'm, st- I'm still waiting for Ronnie Moeller, to, our friend, to set it all up because I'll be yeah. there as soon as he does. Absolutely. Thanks so much, right. Jerry. All right, man. I'll see you, Steve.